Hello, uh, Armin here. In this video, we will break down Flame Boy R&D. Let's get started. So here we have a basic setup uh, and we have several things that we can control with a MIDI controller. So we have some sliders to enable changes in procedural setup, uh, changes in materials, changes in uh, particles and in fields uh, or smoke simulation in this case. And we have a camera switch. So basically we have camera four camera positions that we can choose and jump back and forward to our liking. Now, the major group sets uh, of the most important things in this setup I marked out with a color code. So we have uh, lighting, we have a field system, then we have uh, procedurals, particles, and a, a control system for the MIDI controller and for the camera. So I think it's gonna be easier if we just go step by step and we tackle every single thing one by one. So with that said, I'm gonna put everything to zero, hit home, stop the play hab, playback it, and I'm gonna go for a timeline. Right, so here as you see we have several layers. All of these layers actually correspond with different settings in the setup. So the first one is lights and fractal material. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this step or this setup. So for the general setup uh, I used voxel cone lighting. So voxel cone lighting makes very nice ambient occlusion. It's probably my favorite node when it comes to lighting because it's very cheap. Reason why it is very cheap is because it lives in a bounded space. Bounded space that is given by a bounding box. So anything that is inside of the bounding box, as you see here, this, uh, this cube is actually uh, affected and lit up by voxel cone lighting. So all you have to do is just connect the bounding box to the second input bounding box and it's pretty much good to go. Obviously you should turn on deferred rendering, but that you already know. Right, so aside of that we have environment uh, map, so we could have a little bit more intricate reflections. Uh, and here in the bottom is where things get a little bit more interesting. So for now I'm going to disable uh, both of the material nodes. <coughs> and uh, this is more or less how the raw model that I brought in from Mixamo looks. Now, if you are not familiar with Mixamo, I'm more than happy to uh, advocate for this page because it's brilliant. It's absolutely free of charge, it has a ton of characters that you can choose from, and it has a ton of animations to accompany those characters. Not only you can use the library that they have, uh, you can actually upload your own model, just pin in the wrists and elbows and all that, and you will have a rigged uh, model that you can use with Notch and various other softwares. So. Back to Notch then. Um, all the fun things with this fractal and noise happens in the material node. So I'm gonna pipe it back so now we actually know how this looks. And we are using two material inputs because this model was split into two parts. So there's a torso and there's a hands and, and legs that are separate. So how did... Uh, how does this material work? Well, the basic property uh, is uh, this fractal noise right here. So if we preview how it looks, it's actually in the size of 2,500 and 2,500 and it's set to the noise type wrapped 3. So there's quite a few to choose from. Right, and as you see, it's actually animating now. So nothing very special about this. It's uh, just colored in orange uh, and uh, yeah, it's a fractal noise. So this fractal noise is connected to several inputs in both of the materials. So the color texture and uh, to the alpha map. So that exactly is the thing that enables us to see through the model. So if you connect a material that is a, a let's say, black and white pass or a pass that has alpha to the alpha map, and if you scroll to the alpha transparency properties, you will see that there's a different ways you can treat alpha. So the default is opaque, which you already have when you just uh, put in a clean material node. But if you switch it through to alpha to coverage, uh, anything that is black will be considered alpha or see-through. So all of a sudden, if you pipe in a material, if you connect it to the alpha map, well, there you go. You actually have a see-through setup. So not only that, if you actually mark up the one or two material nodes that you used, uh, and if you alter the, let's see, alpha property, it slowly sort of animates in. So I kind of like this effect. So that's exactly why I used it. So the uh, biggest takeaway here is a fractal noise or any other generator or texture connected to several inputs. So the color texture and the alpha map texture to achieve this specific look. Uh, and of course, it's all set to alpha mode, alpha to coverage. Right, let's move on to the next step. 
and that's procedurals. So here we have a, a two procedural routes working with two procedural meshings. Now, the reason why we have two of them is because I wanted two separate looks. So I'm going to start with the first one. So here we have a bottom look, which is actually powered by the very same 3D model. So the very same thing we've gotten from Mixamo. It is using the 3D object as a um, facilitator to be rendered. And the render that we chose for procedurals is procedural meshing. If procedural meshing is something new to you and you are not very familiar with it, uh, check out the link in the description. Uh, it's going to lead you to a stream that talks all about procedurals. Right, so I'm not going to cover the basics of it, but uh, we have, as mentioned, two procedural routes because we, we want to have two separate looks. So one is responsible for this, well, let's call it a lava base. And the other one is responsible for this overlay that looks a little bit like a fractal displacement. Actually, it's FPM displacement. So the reason why I have two is because I wanted to use specific materials for them, as you can connect only one material per one procedural meshing. And I wanted to cut the center. So basically, I have two procedural roots. Uh, this one is working with procedural meshing and it has 3D object. So this is pretty straightforward. There's not much going on. There's a little bit alterations here for the material. It's using fractal noise, so this pattern right there. And then on top of that, we have another procedural root with another procedural meshing, which has uh, this texture. So it's basically just a bit of a reflection of environment map. Uh, and then we have the very same 3D object, but that 3D object now is displaced with the FPM displacement. So I find this quite a nice little addition to the designs that I do and you can actually make sure that this becomes uh, dynamic. So basically if I was to set amplitude to zero, it's not there. And if you increase that, all of a sudden interesting things happens. So here is the, is the interesting bit. So basically we have a 3D primitive that is here in the center. It's actually a sphere and it's cutting both of the models. So it's shared by both systems. So both procedural routes are connected with this 3D primitive. And this 3D primitive is attached to a bone structure, so the hips. So basically as this dude is walking, that centerpiece is actually following all the motion that he's producing. Right, so this is fast and dirty a description of what procedurals does here in this setup. So basically we have two passes, one for the inner lava, one for the displaced sort of outer layer. And they are both connected via this 3D primitive that just cuts the center of the setup. Because, well, why not? Right, next thing is particles. So this is rather straightforward. Basically the same mesh is fed to two uh, mesh emitters. The reason why we have two is because uh, there is one render that is using points, so these little sparks, and the other render that is using um, trails, so for those trails. Uh, the reason why I chose to have two is because I wanted to split their behavior. Um, so again, we have two mesh emitters. They both have a different render. So one is with point render, the other one is with trail, and they have a variation of the effector. So turbulence and velocity on one, and then velocity, turbulence, curl noise, and vortex on the other, just to make a little bit more dynamic setting. Now I've used a render layer here because I wanted to add some post effects to specifically this part of the rig. So I didn't want those post effects to affect everything. I wanted just to work with the particle. So what I've used, I'm gonna disable this now. Uh, what I've used was frame feedback. So I just wanted a little bit smoother trail. So if you see now when I enable it, it becomes a little bit more smooth, like the swoosh is a little bit more abstract. Uh, and then I added glow because well, every single particle system needs glow. Perhaps one thing that is worth mentioning, and perhaps you're not aware of it, uh, it's really cool, neat little setting, uh, is the fact that point render has a motion blur. So motion blur, if you increase it, I'm gonna go ballistic here, I'm gonna set it to three. As you see, all of a sudden, all the points are trailing a little bit. So they become a little bit more organic when there's when they are set to zero, it's, it's a little bit static and it's a little bit to CG for my liking. So yeah, I added a bit of that. That's just a cool little thing that you might turn on or off depending on what you're building. Right, so now we're familiar with the particles. Next thing I did was a field system. So there we go. So these are our fields. Uh, again, it's using a render layer because I wanted to address some post effects specifically for fields. And if we were to talk about fields specifically, 
um, there are a couple of things that are happening here. So we have field lighting and we have field shadow. So those two nodes are working hand in hand for uh, shading. Uh, we're of course using the same 3D object as a 3D object emitter. That's all the motion that is corresponding with the body. We have field render. That's more or less the only render the field has. There's several other options, but most likely if you're working with fields, that's the one you're always going for. And then we have a turbulence, a field, uh, sorry, fluid effector, uh, and primitive collision effector. So what uh, each of those three uh, does in this setting. I'm going to move the FBM deformer. We're going to talk about that separately. So I'm going to disable them all. You're going to see how clean uh, clean pass looks with no effector. So it's absolutely boring. So first I added turbulence. Uh, I don't necessarily like the defaults. So I usually turn the velocity amount way down to something like 0 0.2 uh, and then I increase the noise scale. So it sort of starts to curl a little bit more, like becomes a bit more organic. <laughs> and then I added a fluid effector. So fluid effector uh, adds uh, vorticity. So vorticity is these swirls. If you're having something like fire simulation those little swirls that goes up while the fire is simulating that's literally it that's exactly where you would enable it here in notch so velocity uh, sorry vorticity confinement scale that's that's a good setting to remember and uh since fields works in a confined space just like uh just like voxel cone lighting uh I didn't really like the fact that it's in the square. So I added a primitive collision. Uh, so primitive collision, once it's inverted, it uh, contains the simulation in a specific shape that you've chosen. So in this case, I went for the sphere. I think this looks a little bit neater. So if we were to disable this, you would see that this is a square, boring, circle or sphere, much better. Uh, subject for discussions, I guess. And uh, the last thing that is added here is a FBM deformer. So FBM deformer adds even more little details to the setting. So basically you have a uh, control over displacement amount, uh, animation rate, and many other settings. So I find this as a very, very good node to add an extra bit of detail without increasing the field with the depth and height and overkilling your GPU. Now, uh, just like with procedurals, if you're not familiar with fields, uh, link down below, Check it out. There's a stream about it. There's a lot of good stuff there. Hopefully something useful for you. Yeah, something useful for you. And there are a couple of post effects, obviously glow <laughs> as previously and tint. Now, if you see the highlights here are in white and I thought that that doesn't really match with the rest of the settings. So I just added a tint, which is a little bit sort of pinkish or, or reddish. So it just made everything look a little bit more coherent. And then there's glow because, well, it's mandatory, it's glow. So we have spoken about fields, procedurals, and particles. Uh, now it's time to talk a little bit about the control. Now everything here is controlled with this uh, media controller. So if I slide a slider, I can change the, the looks of the render. So basically I can enable particles or field simulation or the material changes. And I have a little switch for several uh, camera positions. So if you are using a MIDI controller and uh, you haven't done that before, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on how to enable it. So all you have to do is go to devices, audio and MIDI devices property. Here you will see the MIDI controller that you connected. Uh, and if you see it there, that's pretty much it. You are done and done. Uh, a little gotcha with Windows. Windows only allows one MIDI controller per one software. So basically if you're running several pieces of software, that you uh, want to use a MIDI controller with, you will have to get a third party app to route the signal. So basically, if you want to use a MIDI controller with Notch, make sure that it's only Notch that you're using it with. So with that said, let me show you how to connect this. So if I grab a post effect, uh, something like blog glitch and connect it to the root. Yep, it's there, it's working. And if I want to control it with MIDI, all I would have to do is grab a MIDI modifier, connect it to the property that I want to control, in this case, the active. And now I just have to make sure that this MIDI modifier uh, node knows whichever the button that I'm referring to. So in this case, I want to use this one. So I'm going to press listen for channel. Now it knows that it's channel 12, CC22. And there we go. 
we have an on off button. So in this very same logic, all of these things are connected. So basically we have a slider for mesh emitters emission rate property. So that allows us to either kill off or enable particles and you just gradually come on and come off. Same thing with the uh, fields. So in fields, we're using a 3D object emitters amount property. And, and that's a, again, very gradual setting. So basically it doesn't abruptly kill the field on the screen. It just vaporizes, I guess that's the good word. Uh, and uh, quite the same thing with the materials here. So in the materials, we have alpha property. So if we turn it on and off, you see just what it gradually comes in and comes out. And uh, yeah, we have another thing going on. So it's FBM displacement. There's a property called amplitude. That too right here is controlled with the slider. So you may have noticed that as I'm sliding these sliders, there's some uh, text coming on the screen. So this text right here is just uh, image 2D. Uh, with, a, with a texture file, so an, an image that I brought in from another package. So I just made a, a little picture with a tiny graphical element and text representing whatever the slider does. So once we enable specific things I've shown before, uh, we actually send the very same signal to smooth envelope and that smooth envelope then sends the signal to the alpha property. So basically as we enable, let's say, particles, we actually enable this little text too. Now, the reason why we have smooth envelope in between is because I wanted to have a bit more gradual change because it's quite horrible when things are just snapping on screen. It doesn't look slick. So with the smooth envelope, that's all fixed. We have attack and decay properties. Just think of it as a Bezier curve for your on and off switches, for instance. Okay, and then we have uh, a bit more complex thing in this setup here, uh, a tweening null that is responsible for changes in camera. So I think to illustrate this better, I'm just gonna make a little sample, uh, a very simple one. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a new layer. I'm gonna call this um, tweening null. I should probably learn to spell it. There we go. So tweening null allows you to set in specific coordinates and then with the index switch through those coordinates. Um, first of all, we will need a, well, the very tweening null. Uh, we're gonna connect it to the root and we're gonna need some kind of a object that we can pan camera around. So I'm gonna go for a shape 3D. I'm gonna set it to a box and I'm gonna grab a camera. So let's say, this is my camera position one and I want to have several uh, more of the positions. So I'm going to copy this one out, connect it to the root, disable this for now. And I'm going to set the second one somewhere else, maybe here. There we go. So that's my camera two. Again, I'm going to copy this out, disable it and make sure that I'm looking through the third one. Then I just copied out. Let's say this, my, this is my camera number three. Now I could go with the select child node, that one you're already familiar with, I think. I presume there's a lot of people using that. Uh, and in the select child node, I can change index and all of a sudden the rendered uh, camera will be enabled. That's all cool and great, but if you want a smooth transition from camera to camera, that is exactly where the tweening node comes handy. So how does tweening null works or how do we translate these camera positions to a position uh, to positions that tweening null can read? Well, basically I would start by connecting them all to the input of the nulls. And, and then I would grab a new fresh camera from the node list and output it via tweening null. So basically these nodes right here gives us a positional value and a tweening null interprets that allows us to choose which one of those positional values should be looked at and then it outputs the camera. So for this to work, all I have to do now is just make sure that I change this camera from camera to a geometry null. So all of a sudden this node right here only contains positional uh, data that I actually need. Change, change. 
change. So there we go. We are in the pers first position. Now if I put the index to, let's say, 1 and 2, all of a sudden I'm cycling through these nulls. I hope that makes sense. So basically, this is just a smooth way to go from one sp state to another state, so on and so forward. So exactly this is happening here with four positions with the twinning null and one camera. So all of this rig here in the bottom allows me to switch through uh, positions with the MIDI controller. With the MIDI controller. Um, the reason why I added this, uh, well, let's call it quite a big rig, is because my MIDI controller is set to operation gate. And that means that if I press a button and I release it, uh, after the button is released, it would come back to the zero state or the starting state. And that's not what I want in this setting. In this setting, I want to be able to switch through cameras and keep the active camera that I've chosen. So it should be one, two, three, or four. So in order to do that, I had to add a couple of extra nodes. So basically I needed to tell Notch that when things are triggered, please keep it until I say so. Now I'm not gonna explain you what's going on here because there's just quite a few nodes and to be honest you don't even have to go deep into why and what you can just go for view bins and you will find this setup right here available for you and it's called button switcher so one of the notch product specialists actually built this and it's built this exactly for this reason you don't have to uh, waste time you can just grab it and use it so think of it as a uh, radio midi operation for your gate uh, set MIDI controller. I hope this makes sense. Anyways, as I'm pressing all of these buttons, uh, not only I'm changing the camera position, I'm actually enabling this little image 2D that actually has a little picture of a camera icon. So basically that's just another thing that adds a little bit more of a visual value and readability to the settings. So once you press, you actually know that you press something. And of course, that's that too is going through smooth envelopes, so things are a little bit more flush. It doesn't abruptly go on and off the screen. And I think we're there. This is pretty much it. Uh, we've covered all the things that we have here in uh, this setup. So thank you for sticking around throughout all of this video. So I think this covers the basics of the setup. If you find some things that you would like to explore a little bit further, uh, I left some links down below to streams that talks about procedurals and fields and, and modifiers. All of those might come handy for you if you want to explore these things further. Now, if you're completely new to Notch, uh, I left a link to Essential Training. So that's 101. That's exactly where you get around to learn, well, what Notch is and how can it benefit your create, creative life. Um, thank you for watching and see you in the next one.